uh, a warm welcome from my side. Um, it's per the first <laughs> webinar uh, that I'm giving, but uh, we need to train that. And there are two further personal remarks at the very outset. Uh, first, I haven't been to the hairdressers uh, for a few weeks, so my apologies uh, if it uh, if my haircut is not really fresh, but uh, the same may be true for all of you, and I hope you're fine. And second, as uh, Christoph mentioned, uh, I'm a political scientist by training. Uh, and as you will see, I will talk a, a lot about uh, <laughs> a lot about technical things, and I might enter the domain of software engineers, computational, ling computational linguists, uh, and computer scientists. Uh, and my apologies in advance if um, you think some of this needs to be improved. Now, um, I looked at the development of using corpora uh, in the social sciences and the humanities from the perspective of a political scientist. Uh, and I, I would like to start with a few observations, how I see the development of the field. First of all, uh, we have so many algorithms. Um, computational linguists might think, and computer scientists too, well, there's so much more research that we want to do. But from the perspective of a social scientist, of a political scientist, uh, the, uh, the algorithms that we have are overwhelming already, and they are very powerful. And then we had a long discussion on... Uh, uh, um, data management uh, and how we can date, make data management fair. Uh, and there's there has also been a very, very good uh, development in that respect. Uh, so I think I'm satisfied with that. But my starting point was that in the social sciences, and that may apply to the humanities too, we are starting to use corpora, uh, but we are not yet, or we have not been yet very good at acquiring Langu natural language processing techniques. Uh, so how can we make use of the different annotation levels and um, possibilities that are there? Second, uh, we have large corpora, but many of the NLP tools uh, take a long time when you use them on large corpora. So they don't scale very well. How can we improve that? Uh, third, uh, when you're entering the field, you have so many possibilities what you can do, but uh, you need data to, to really acquire new techniques. And uh, how, uh, how, how do you learn that? You need data to do that, but uh, the data may not necessarily be there. Uh, fourth, um, uh, the data that you have uh, is uh, includes a lot of assumptions, uh, and you want, do not only want to reproduce uh, the analysis itself, but the data. Uh, and this is why I started to think we shouldn't be only be fair, but we should be fairer than that. Uh, and the last R, R would stand for reproducibility uh, of the data. So this was my point of departure. Uh, and I, as I will mention, I think we have made progress in these respects. And the last one is uh, when we have the data, we have the analytical tools and they are uh, richly annotated, we don't only want to use um, uh, the quantitative approach to text, but we want to go back to the text very often. So we want to have an integration uh, of quantification and qualitative research. And this was is what I have started to call quantification, which is the integration of quanti the quantitative and qualitative analysis of text. So these are the challenges. In uh, the project, the Paul Mine project, which is my context, mm, we care about substantial research, data, code, tutorials, and we are a small, very small center in the Clarin context. Uh, our research is mostly about uh, migration and integration affairs and the policy process in migration and integration. We have a few projects in that respect. But then, as I uh, learned about the possibilities, what you can do with corpora, 
um, I, w- I sense we're lacking the data to do that. And we developed um, a set of data sets uh, that are uh, publicly available to a certain extent. Um, the hallmark corpus of our project is Germaparl, is a corpus of the German Bundestag. Uh, we have a version with the regional parliaments too. It's freshly published with Zenodo, uh, the open science repository offered by CERN from the natural sciences. Uh, and um, as we had the tools, we started to prepare a few other corpora. We have a corpus of the United Nations General Assembly. It's the most universal corpus we could think of for training purposes. We have a corpus, a specialized corpus on regional uh, debates called MICPARL. We have worked with uh, newspaper reports. So I think we have a very rich uh, set of data that we uh, have an offer. Uh, and upcoming uh, releases are one of uh, Paripal, that's a corpus of the French uh, Assemblée Nationale. Uh, we have a corpus of the Nationalrat in Austria. We call it Austropal. Uh, and we've updated the Dutch PAL corpus a bit for some a, a research project. And we'll put that on Synodo. Uh, but one of my uh, frustration uh, frustrations when having these corpora was that we do not yet have the analytical tools to deal with corpora that have a couple of million, maybe 100 million tokens. So in the past two years, we also developed a few packages for your corpus uh, analysis. Um, the most visible one is the pole mine R package. It's an R package that offers an elementary vocabulary for corpus analysis. And as a back end, um, we use RCPPCWB, a horrible name for marketing, but it makes things fast. It wraps a fast C library, the corpus workbench, into uh, an R environment. And then uh, there's freshly published at CRAN CW tools. These are tools to create and manage, uh, manage uh, indexed corpora. And I'll talk about the corpus format that we use later on. So we made a bit of progress in that respect in, in our project. Um, and if you're interested in, u- interested in using some of these tools, I'd also like to mention that we have a set of tutorials, uh, slides that we call uh, Using Corpora in Social Science Research, UCSSR in short. So there's training material too, and we really like to use everything uh, in the uh, university classroom. So there has been a lot of development. And uh, how do you see the state of the art uh, today? Uh, We are able to work with large-scale linguistically annotated corpora. The corpora of our project have a couple of million uh, tokens. Uh, We have developed the tools Uh, to uh, add linguistic annotations. And if you're interested, we have uh, two fresh packages called Big NLP and Big LDA uh, at GitHub that we use uh, internally for adding annotations to the corpus with Stanford Core NLP and the Mallet Topic Modeling Library. Um, the, uh, The availability of data has improved. In our project, we really enjoy Working with Zenodo, uh, we do that for like two weeks, but it's a great infrastructure to make uh, data publicly available. Uh, and we think that we are getting fairer. Uh, we can offer the code uh, to uh, prepare the data. And uh, I think we can claim that we have a 100% rep- reproducibility of the data. So uh, we are somewhat satisfied with these developments. But the real challenge from our point of view is that um, the integration of quantitative and uh, qualitative approaches uh, to text, uh, that's a requirement, but it is an unfulfilled promise. And we still need to make progress in that respect. So of course, there are tools like MaxQDA or Atlas TI uh, and web annotation programs uh, like like Web Anno or the Brad annotations uh, tool, but to really integrate it into a workflow that uses large scale corpora uh, and uh, the inspection of text, that's difficult. So, uh, 
our assumption is that for valid research, if we really want to make clear statements uh, on our fine findings on large-scale corpora, we need to combine quantitative and qualitative approaches to textual data. The problem that we have is the tools are there, but it's difficult to use them. And in a project, you, um, you almost need a software engineer who will help you to integrate quantitative and qualitative approaches to text. So you need a funding for the software engineer. The funding will end, and then you have some solution, but it's not sustainable. Uh, and all the nice tools um, will will be deprecated after a while. Mm. I just uh, learned in vivo. Of course, uh, yeah, let's let's keep that for the discussion later. I'd, I'd like to hear your uh, point of view. So what I started to think about is uh, that um, we should have a open source modular tool set that we can use for combining quantitative and qualitative research quantitative research that can be used by an ordinary computational social scientist. So you don't need to be a hardcore software engineer to set up a web uh, environment. So it should be small, easy to use, very, very flexible. That's my vision that I want to talk about. Uh, and I, I'll pursue the following five steps. Mm, first, some ideas on theory. Uh, why is it so important to achieve, achieve qualification? Why does it matter for anybody who's dealing with text? Second, there will be a few remarks on the data structures that we need to achieve qualification. It's a matter of design, I'd like say, to say. Then what do we need to do to implement qualification? Uh, I'll show you a few examples uh, about the tools that are already there. And uh, then there's the big invitation. There's still a lot of work to do. And uh, how can we achieve something uh, to, uh, together? And that's what I'd like to discuss at the very end uh, with you. So theory is code. I like that uh, formula. And it justifies why we need, uh, why, how are you? Um, perspective on text as uh, people from the social sciences and the humanities requires uh, a certain infrastructure. Uh, and you can approach text from two different vanguards. The first is uh, embedded in the tradition of uh, the humanities as Moretti uh, introduced or the idea introduced by Moretti a couple of years ago is that we need to unlearn uh, close reading and move to distant learning because it's a requirement to get a sense for the larger patterns in a lot of text. Uh, the quote is somewhat long to read it out, uh, but he says, we know how to read texts. No, so now let's to learn, uh, so now let's learn how not to read them. Distant reading, where distance, let me repeat, is a condition of knowledge. It allows you to focus on units that are much smaller or much larger, larger than the text, devices, themes, types, or genres and subsystems. And if between the very small and the very large, the text itself disappears, well, this is one of the cases when, where you can justifiably say less is more. Moretti was a, uh, comes from literary criticism. So he's from the humanities. And uh, he made a very strong case that there are important scenarios when we need the quantitative analysis of text. There's, in the social sciences, I, I observe uh, the Texas data movement. It's really embedded in political science. And their main concern was uh, to derive quantitative indicators from text. Uh, and uh, scaling party positions were, was an important driver uh, for for that in, in that vein. Uh, and they are very proud that you can stop reading texts. The short quote is: While our math method is designed to analyze the context of a text, it's not necessary for an analysis using the technique to understand or even read the text to which that technique is applied. So. 
two different contexts for uh, that justify working with large corpora, but I'd argue that um, it's it's an obsolete methodological uh, divide, uh, and no no matter where you come from, you need to go. You need the ability to go back to the text, the text that uh, data uh, tradition that I um, just mentioned uses natural language processing to be able to deal with large corpora. It acquires data and text mining uh, techniques. Uh, it has approached someone to, to machine learning. And there was an important plea by Justin Grimmer uh, and co-authors in 2013. He said, there's so many algorithms that we can use, but we are losing a sense for what actually goes on in the text. So we need to validate, validate, validate. We need justifications that our measurements are really correct, that we know that we measure uh, what we actually measure. Um, so in the quantitative social science tradition, people are claiming we need to go back to the text. We need to, the integration of quantitative and qualitative approaches to text. And the same is actually happening in, uh, in the humanities. Uh, in the e-humanities or the digital humanities, um, there's a, a strong sense beyond Moretti that you do not only need distant reading, but you need close reading too. Uh, Stolpe and Lemke have called that blended reading or Whitein scalable reading. So it's not enough just to move beyond the individual text. You need to go back to the, in the, in the individual text. And this is why I argue that quantification is uh, important for every, everybody. So it doesn't really matter where you come from. If you have a quantitative approach to text, you need the qualitative approach to, to validate findings. So if that is true, if you need the quantity to combine quantity and quality, we have a set of tools but setting these quantitative infrastructure is really expensive, you need software engineers. Uh, and what can you do to do it uh, in a social science team? Um, first, it's a matter of design. You need appropriate data structures. Uh, and this is when I'm moving really to, to our project uh, and the philosophy of the Palmine R project in combination with the RCPP uh, CW package and C CWV tools. Um, it uses a three tier architecture. It combines a C level of code with an R level of code and you put JavaScript uh, on top of it. Um, the Polymine R package tries to offer a basic vocabulary for quantification. Uh, those of you who have an R background uh, may know the package dply R. It, uh, it has a very similar claim. Uh, it's, it's very common and says, we want to offer the verbs for programming that are necessary for data transformation. The same is, that's the idea that is behind the Polman R ca package too. So you can work flexibly with corpora and create sub corpora flexibly. And you have corpus ob object and uh, sub corpora that you create by uh, calling a method called partition or subset. Uh, then you have all kinds of uh, verbs and nouns for quantitative approaches to text. You can count, you can create co occurrences, you can extract features. Uh, and you create can 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 go the back go down the back of first approach and create term document matrices. But then you have um, the tools for qualitative analysis. If you are if it's enough to look at small chunks of text, you can look at concordances using the quick method, or you can uh, reconstruct the full text of a corpus. And there's the good get token stream, the start markdown, and the HTML and the uh, read method. And the read method is, I think, the most, the best name for, for that part. So you have these words combined in the Polman I package. But um, uh, I, I want to flip. Oh, well, well, well. One slide that I wanted to show is empty. And that's the three tier uh, architecture slide. 
So if we to implement that vocabulary, you need, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I'll send you a link later on. Uh, to implement that vocabulary, you have the R level, and below that, you need a data management uh, that is somewhat different what, from what you have in the R context um, otherwise. Uh, and this is why I use the Corpus Workbench as a backend. It uh, keeps the token stream of a corpus intact. So it doesn't change the sequence of words. Everything is there, but not in a plain string format. But the tokenized uh, text is saved in a data format, in a binary data format that is very appropriate for textual data. So it's uh, not a conventional database, such as a SQLite database or MySQL. It's, it's really a data format that is uh, that um, enables us to model the features of text very well. Um, and it's, uh, it's common. It has been developed at the University of Stuttgart in the mid-1990s. But common tools such as CQP Web uh, and other environments are, using, are still using uh, uh, the Corpus Workbench. I put a an R layer a layer on the Corpus Workbench, and this is the prerequisite to have all the wonderful quantitative uh, uh, means for analysis, and at the same time to be able to reconstruct the text. Um, and once you have the R environment, you can put JavaScript and all the inter interactivity that comes with JavaScript on top. Now, um, I, I like to call it a, to think that Paul Mine R in the environment is a people's corpus miner because you don't have any hard infrastructural requirements. Any kind of computer that has keys will work. It works on Windows, Linux, Mac OS, it's portable. Um, and um, it, it just doesn't work on a um, tablet. So you need something with keys. Uh, and once you have R and R Studio, which is an IDE for R installed. It's uh, these uh, three lines of code that will install your Polman R uh, and a corpus such as Germapal on, on your machine, and then you can start uh, going. So it's install packages Polman R, install packages Germapal, uh, Germapal download corpus, you get the full corpus, one gigabyte, and then you can start with an analysis. And I just have uh, this example, how to count, count or how to generate a keyword and context analysis. Let me mention here. Let me mention here that you can install things locally uh, on any kind of or machine, but you can also put it on a server. Uh, then there's an R Studio server edition, and something we always also tried is um, an open CPU environment. So R and the data are hosted on a server, and you can access a from your local machine, it's surprisingly fast. And it has the big advantage that when you have licensed material, you don't have to violate light, uh, licenses. So that's what we do with the MIG Press corpus, a corpus of newspaper articles on migration and integration. We may not share the data itself, but we can give users access on the data on an open CPU server. So that's somewhat technical, but it's very, very useful for licensed material. Uh, and as I saw that somebody asked about uh, uh, Twitter, um, we have a bit of experience with Twitter, uh, but there are many, many people out there that are much, much more experienced with Twitter. Mm. But uh, if you work with Twitter Corpora, you also have the problem that it's licensed materials. You actually you cannot really share it freely. That might also be a scenario one when you want to run it on an open CPU server. That's an experimental um, setup, but it works uh, as we far can we can see. Now I want to tell you a bit about the work towards quantification uh, that has uh, already happened. Um, and uh, this okay. This is an old fo photo. Um, I want. Uh, I I now need to switch from the PDF presentation to an HTML presentation so that I can 
um, show you one a few, a few of the interactive elements. Mm. Just give me a second. I start sharing my screen. Um, okay. And um, now, um, can anybody give me feedback if if you can see the reading anywhere slide? Would be great to hear that. Um, Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Um, when we want to quantify, the first thing that we will need is to reconstruct the full text uh, in, in a manner that is flexible and that it allows interactivity. The way I've imp implemented that is a full text HTML widget. HTML widget comes from the context of our, so it's and a small HTML tool that you can use very flexibly. So uh, why do we want to read? Uh, do we want to read when we work with co-occurrences? Uh, we want to know in which contexts would occur. So traditionally, we'll, we would look at a quick or a concordance. But very often, we also want to read the full text where a concordance occurs. Uh, often, we want to reconstruct subcorpora. Sub uh, or the text from a subcorpora, for instance, uh, to classify a set of subcorpora to generate labeled data. Or if we have work with topic models, um, we have a unsupervised classification of, uh, of texts. And we want to know what the words that are indicative of a topic uh, in which context they actually occur. And then we can use the um, data to generate label data uh, again. So there are many scenarios when you really want to go back to the full text. In the Polymine R package, there is the read method, and you can apply it on any kind of object, on a, a quick object, on a co-occurrences object, and on subcorpora. Um, but then I think you need a, a full text widget and it uh, renders a subcorpus into an HTML widget. Uh, so uh, you want to see that. Uh, there are three examples I want to show you. The first one is you have um, uh, an HTML, a, a, a document. And in this document, I integrated the full text uh, widgets. So you have scrollable text in here. Uh, and you can highlight certain tokens that are interested. I use the traditional text, uh, the first chapter from uh, Jane Austen's novel, Emma, and I highlighted Emma uh, in pink, and Mr. Knightley in uh, light blue. Uh, and this is when you see uh, where references made to both of them. But of course, there are more reasonable scenarios uh, that you would like to use. Um, you can put the full, te full text HTML widgets also into slides. Um, and I think this is very useful for uh, when you are teaching text analysis that you can show uh, the text behind a certain quant quantitative analysis. Uh, and this, you can also use a couple of uh, texts in the same context. So I can click through a set of speeches that are listed in the table on the left and uh, look uh, through these different speeches, OK? This is what the full text HTML widget can do. Now, these are not very impressive examples at this stage. Uh, you can combine um, the quantitative analysis and the HTML widgets in a so-called Shiny app. Uh, and I put a Shiny app that is included in the Polymine R package online. So this is a Shiny app hosted on a server. And I want to do something very simple. I start with, and sorry that it's German, but it works best at this stage. I, I want to do a Corcoran's analysis on the German pile corpus. Uh, I use the query Freude, which is pleasure. I get the hits or the Corcoran's. Um, I can click on uh, one of the tokens in the neighborhood, and I can go on clicking uh, on the concordance the and then you get to to the full to the full text okay so that's the idea or how you could use the full text html widget so um 
a prerequisite. Uh, you can go back to the text. Second, um, the full text as such uh, is not very telling. Uh, we want to see what our statistical analysis does with the text. So we want to see um, what the digital dictionaries do, what the word weights are. Uh, we might want to visualize multiple dictionaries um, in, uh, one, uh, dict uh, in, in, in one document. And maybe we want uh, tooltips, to see tooltips uh, too. So we do not only need colors uh, of tokens, but more, we want to see more numeric information. In the Polman R package, we have a highlight method and a tooltips method. And then also you need uh, the ability to uh, highlight and tooltip things in the full text widget. Three examples again. First is, um, let's imagine we have done a sentiment analysis, a simple dictionary-based uh, sentiment analysis. So you have positive and negative words, uh, dictionaries with positive and negative words, and you have word whites white for the positive and the negative words. We did that for uh, the corpus of the United Nations General Assembly uh, for the word sanctions, because we were interested in this scenario, whether the connotations of sanctions have changed. Uh, and this is a, an interactive table. So you can click through the table. And ye, the positive tokens are highlighted in green and the negative tokens are highlighted in orange. And then when you move over the tokens, uh, you have the positive or negative word whites. And I really like to use this this slide or this kind of slide uh, to teach uh, to teach students uh, um, about the perils uh, of um, uh, using dictionary bait. Oh, you you didn't see the slide. Um, just can you give me a, a a feedback whether you you saw the slide? Okay, I, I, I think I want to continue, but uh, I, I may have been talking. I, I please want to need. Okay, good. So uh, let me let me continue. Um, the second example for highlighting is the evaluation of topic models. Um, I think many have seen uh, or read the classic articles of David Bly. And in, in his uh, 2012 article, he explains the intuition behind LDA like this. Um, you have um, a text, uh, you have a set of relevant topics, and you highlight uh, the different tokens with different colors. The words that are indicative of a topic are highlighted in yellow and uh, pink and light blue. Okay, so we can do that with um, the mm. uh, we, we can do that with uh, uh, our tool too. And it's a flex dashboard that we have here. Um, I put one online. Then we have uh, three windows on the top left. We have a, a list of documents and the documents that are present in uh, the, the, the topics that are present in the documents. On the left bottom, you have a list with the tokens and the word whites. And then we can go through the documents and see the highlighted vocabulary. And we don't have tooltips yet, but you can see the uh, vocabulary that is indicative of topic 105 that I sense to be a bit about migration in the documents. And we can go through the documents. And of course, we could um, augment this tool so that we can have evaluative choices uh, on the different documents. OK. And the last uh, demo, I, I, I'll skip that and show you uh, in full later on. 
the the last part that uh, is necessary for quantification is that we want to annotate almost everything. We make uh, an evaluative choices about um, what we see, about the meaning that is embedded in the text. And in the qualitative research traditions, uh, annotation is very important to communicate evaluative decisions to other researchers. Um, the other way around, uh, when you use machine learning, you need label data and annotations are required or, or the coding of data is required uh, to feed data into a machine learning uh, um, uh, algorithm. We've implemented that. There's an edit method that you have in the Polman R package and you can edit all kinds uh, of, sorry, uh, all kinds of uh, of ta uh, tables. Uh, I'll skip showing that. Then you have, uh, a, we have a simple text annotation tool. That is called Analyte. Uh, I'll also skip that. And this is the, yeah, well, the, the most interesting example. Let us imagine that we have a three dimensional uh, illustration of co-occurrences in, um, uh, in a text. In this case, it's speeches in the United Nations General Assembly in 2000. Uh, then we have uh, tooltips, so you can see the number of accounts for your token, for instance, or you can go to an edge and then you have uh, the log, likely has, uh, log likelihood test value. And now this is the idea. You can click on anything, see the text, the textual data behind the statistical data, make a um, uh, an annotation, uh, uh, save it to the data, and process that annotation in the environment later on. Okay, and we can uh, do this uh, in all kinds of contexts. Um, these are code examples that I will skip, uh, as uh, I've been talking for a while already. Uh, I want to. Tell, tell you my ideas, what needs to be done uh, and about the work that is ahead. Uh, what we have is a modular tool set, not a framework uh, in, the, in the R envi environment. We try to be lazy. So we don't try to do everything that is feasible ourselves, but we use all kinds of tools that are already there uh, in uh, to 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 use them. For instance, for editing tables, there's the wonderful R hands-on table library, a JavaScript library, and we can use that from R, and we we use that. Then, second, HTML widgets. For those of you who know R, are a very very flexible tool to create interactive JavaScript pieces that can be embedded in all kinds of documents or that you can, can embed in slides and put online. So HTML widgets are a really, really nice uh, element of a quantification environment. Third, you can use Shiny, uh, Shiny apps. That's something we have seen. Uh, and then you can modularize the Shiny code. Uh, and also use it in an interactive R section as a shiny gadget. I haven't shown that, but you can have a pop-up uh, with a text that you can annotate. You can end the gadget, and you'll have the annotation that you have made uh, in the R environment. We've seen a Flex dashboard. So it's an, a dashboard that you can put online to uh, illustrate your research findings and we can work with uh, templates. So this is a lot of R parlance. Um, we can, uh, I can, can tell you more about it uh, later on, um, but it's, it's a modular tool set, not a framework. Uh, if we want to work with that, we uh, need a good, well-developed well sense when you use what, when you want to present results, or when you need a more interactive approach to generate findings. Uh, and we will need, apart from tools, we need recipes, tutorials, proper documentation. So it's, there's a lot to be done with uh, uh, with the bits and pieces that are there. This is what we what is already there. It's um, five packages I started to develop that are at GitHub. So there's the full text R package, 
which is a tool set to generate a full text display, uh, these HTML widgets. Uh, there's uh, the graduate uh, graph annotation widget. That's um, the three-dimensional ver- uh, visualization of Corcoran's graphs that you've seen. There's an analyte package. It's very similar to full text, um, but you can add annotations to text. The topic analysis package is intended to um, combine uh, evaluation of quantitative topic models and the uh, inspection of the text behind uh, topic analysis. And finally, there's a small quantify package that includes all kinds of templates that you can use to generate Flex dashboards and these kind of fancy things. Everything is experimental, and that's what you see with the buttons uh, on on the screen. So uh, it's exper- the the stage of the life cycle is experimental. Some of these tools build on uh, on Travis CI or Appveya, but some don't at this stage. So what I want to achieve is to have a flexible set of tools that uh, allow us to implement all kinds of workflows that combine distant and close reading uh, in a way that is uh, not very, very costly. Um, It could be a lightweight infrastructure for the quantitative analysis of text data, liquid, at at the very end. Uh, And I hope it will be open for everybody. So it could be a people's framework for quantification at the very end. we, we need that in our project context, uh, but I would be very, very interested uh, to hear what you think about all of this, whether I've missed something, are there alternative approaches that are relevant that we should need to consider? What is the relevant previous work? Mm, then it it's, um, I think it's accessible, but it needs coding skills. Uh, and what balance should we strike between using graphical user inf- interfaces and uh, coding on the console? Uh, is anybody interested in, in these things? So will there be users? Is anybody um, uh, is an, anybody uh, can could anybody imagine to join? And how do we build a community around these tools? Something I really like is the R OpenSci uh, project, uh, which uh, is a, a a group of researchers that, that develop a, a a set of tools, and maybe we can do something like this for the quantitative tools. Uh, and that's something I do not really know: is is there a role for the European Open Science Cloud or uh, so the Social Sciences and Humanities Open? cloud. Um, and I think presenting these ideas uh, in the Liva context was uh, the best that I can do. Uh, and I'll be very, very happy to learn more about your ideas. I'd stop at this stage. And I see a, a couple of uh, c- uh, questions already. Um, and if I don't hear objections, mm, uh, I'll uh, I'll start. I just like to start answer, answering these. Oh, thanks, thanks so much, everybody. <laughs> okay, first one: Is there any limitation in size of the corpus? Um, that's important. The corpus we have, or that we have worked with, are between a couple of million, and the biggest one is the British Hansard corpus. It's eight hundred million tokens. So we are approaching the billion. And everything is still fast with a corpus of that size. Technically, with the corpus workbench, there's a limitation of 2 billion tokens. Uh, the development, the developments, developers of the corpus workbench are working to go beyond that limitation. But I guess it will still take time. But there's a simple solution. So imagine you have a corpus of 5 billion or 10 billion. I think you could split it up into a set of smaller corpus uh, and integrating the results uh, into, again, in, into one uh, joint co- count object, one joint term document matrix, that, that's feasible. Uh, there will be a technical limitation when you need uh, a cluster of servers, um, but uh, we have not, that's not yet in sight. Um, uh, I just want to say I'm I'm back on camera just in case. <laughs>
I have something to add to what Andreas just said, but I think that was yes. all right. <laughs> Okay, then I see a, a question from Max Kis, uh, Kiselev that the read function is um, it has a limitation and that you cannot uh, output endless uh, numbers of token tokens. Um, a general remark on the Polman R package. Uh, the uh, um, I, there are many tricks and hacks uh, that uh, I know now. Uh, that speed up things, um, and uh, I'm just in the midst of going back to older code to to make it faster. Uh, one of the aspects is the read method. Uh, the read method uh, constructs an XML or generates a, a string representation of an XML document, and that's not how I would actually do it today. Uh, today I would uh, pass the data data into a JavaScript um, piece of code and let JavaScript do the reconstruction of the full text. So we can speed up things. And if you have um, feedback of the kind of Max, um, please use GitHub. Uh, <laughs> we have a very active dialogue between uh, Christoph and me. And some, sometimes I talk to myself on GitHub just to make my ideas accessible to others. And uh, we are really uh, happy to uh, implement new features or to speed up things if you have observations such as the one of Max. Then I see the question of Tore Hagemann um, uh, on the usage of the MIGPRESS corpus. Um, as I mentioned, it's licensed material. Um, and we have a license for the community of researchers within the German Institute of Integration and Micro Migration Affairs. Um, if you don't belong to an, a member institution, we can cannot give you access right away, but we are quite proud that we have a good model with the, the publishing houses for the reuse of the data, which is uh, it takes a thousand euros and you can re reuse the data. So please get in touch with us if you're interested in using uh, using uh, the MIGPRESS corpus. Okay. Then I see the question of Veronica Keck, um, whether you can use a Polman R for automatic tokenizing adding, and adding word whites for, in, uh, for a new newly created uh, corpus or a data frame. Um, I, the Polman R package tries to be parsimonious. It doesn't do everything. Because we have good tools for, for tokenizing text or for all kinds of natural, natu uh, natural language processing, such as Stanford Core NLP, Spacey, um, UD Pipe, uh, or the Tree Tagger. And uh, what we try to do is to use um, or the, the dedicated package for preparating corpora is CWB tools. You can use CWB tools with uh, Stanford Core NLP, Space in our, uh, Spacey, or anything else, and then write the, the CWB data format to disk and continue working with Polmine R. Uh, and if you have the data in a data frame, for instance, the uh, tidy, you use the tidy text data format, it works quite seamlessly with CWDB tools. And if you can, you, we can assist you with that, or if you feel the documentation of CW tools is not yet sufficient, um, please get in touch or write us an issue on GitHub. Um, we will be happy to, um, to assist you. Good, good. Um, so it's almost 12 o'clock. And I just wondered whether I have missed uh, questions. I think uh, a question which came up uh, some uh, a few times is uh, something along the lines that you said something about the availability of corporate parliamentary um, debates, some of which are already available, such as Gamma Pal or uh, the United Nations Corpus. Or will be available such 
as Austria, France, and the Netherlands. But can you say something about uh, the challenges other kinds of corpora like Twitter data or press uh, data pose to the concept of fair or reproducibility and quantification in general? So, you know. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, first of all, we we have worked a lot with uh, the corpora of uh, parliamentary debates, and uh, we are somewhat specialized on the German context. And we there's actually no need that we do everything in in our uh, project. There's uh, a lot of collaboration actually going on in the Clarin Europe context. There has been a wonderful series of events called Parla Clarin. The next one was supposed to take place in early May in uh, at the ELREC conference at Marseille. And these are gatherings of um, uh, researchers that all work with parliamentary corpora. And actually, there's already a European family of corpora of parliamentary debates. Uh, and I think Jamapal is uh, just one corporate co contribution contribution to this um, to this larger project. Um, now, uh, there, there's a distinction we need to make between data formats. I, I think it's really wise to share data in an XML format because it's sustainable and interoperable. That isn't true for our data format that we use for the actual analysis. XML is not very, very efficient to, uh, XML is not very efficient for fast data processing. It's sustainable and interoperable, but it's not necessarily fast. So to process data using the Corpus Workbench and Polman R and all these kinds of tools, we need to transform the data uh, and add linguistic annotations. Um, and then it's a different format. And we, we, we've just started to use Zenodo uh, as a great um, open uh, science repository that makes um, data accessible. And I think it's a joint enterprise, really, to create the foundations for a data-rich future. So maybe others also want to start using Zenodo. Maybe we can uh, integrate other corpora into or import other corpora into the corpus workbench and assist others to do that and put it on Zenodo. But we don't want to be too hegemonic. Uh, we are really looking forward to the cooperation of many. So um, have I answered the question? I think the, the Twitter question um, was uh, answered roughly. Um, uh, Twitter. We, we can import Twitter data into the Corpus Workbench, but uh, it will depend on the use case that you have. Um, if you are really interested in the text that is communicated, uh, the Corpus Workbench is a wonderful environment. But if you are interested in the re relational nature of the metadata of Twitter, um, a different kind of storage um, might be preferable to the Corpus Workbench. The Corpus Workbench is really focused on the linguistic analysis of text. And, and something I didn't mention is that you have a, a very powerful uh, query engine and that you can use all the kinds of linguistic features uh, to, to do your research. Okay. I still see a question on Ron Decker, uh, a question on COVID and government uh, documents. But I, I, I'm not sure that I see the question of Ron in the history. So if you don't mind, Ron, could you um, maybe you can write down your, your question. So I, I didn't see it. Uh, so maybe you can reformulate. And then finally, I have Katie Co uh, Cooper, uh, additional resources resources or recommendations uh, how we can use uh, the whole environment in teaching. Um, maybe, Christoph, you can 
shared the link for the uh, slides on using copper and social science research, the UCSSR slides. So this is I a set of... Sorry. You, you, you have done that already. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a set of slides that we used to introduce uh, the, the corpora of migration and integration debates in Germany's regional parliaments. And Christoph, in fact, has worked on updating the slides, translating them, and uh, using different data. We then use the United Nations Journal Assembly corpus because it, I think it's a good teaching um, resource in the uh, international context. And Kate, Katie, we will be happy to, to share the, uh, the UCSSR slides um, in the UNGA version as soon as we can. Um, and as you will, you will also see that there's a YouTube channel that we have, but it's not yet really, really populated. I think this summer, summer semester is a great opportunity to develop the open educational resources further because many of us will be, be heavily under pressure to communicate with our students without seeing them. So we need to do, we, we need to get good at uh, doing webinars uh, and to uh, use online slides, uh, to use YouTube channels and all of this. So I hope we will make progress in the upcoming months. Looking at my clock, I see it's 12 o'clock. Um, and I see that Laura Morales has just joined, and I great to hear you. And uh, so there's the Ron Decker question. And I uh, suppose I have a list of COVID measures and a list of government documents. Can I extract which measures were used by which um, governments? So my first idea would be that this is a um, scenario for relation or a named entity recognition and relation extraction. Um, and it's a good question or a good, a good question in our context um, because um, you may, if you have many, many documents, then you, you need to apply named entity recognition. You could use, um, we would use Stanford Core NLP and our implementation in the R context, uh, context is the big NLP package that does th that. You might want to look at that. And uh, the, uh, the beauty of named entity recognition that it is able to detect measures or issues um, that are not already known. Uh, so it, it could help. If you have a list of measures that is already known, you could use the uh, query syntax of uh, the, the Corpus Workbench and look up these measures in the documents. And all of that it takes is to import the documents into the Corpus Workbench. And the CWB tools package is the tool that we would use to do that. OK, so this was a very technical question at the very end. Um, and I hope that we will stay in touch uh, via email, or we'll be happy to receive your issues on GitHub. And uh, all the best. And that's it from my side. Thank you.